Are you there, God? It's me. The one person who still wants to talk about Dear Evan Hansen in 2023. The musical whose fall from three Tonys, a Grammy, and two Laurence Olivier's to international pariah reframed it from uplifting story about a teen overcoming social anxiety to shocking account of three students who, in various ways, completely exploit and capitalize on another student's suicide. And it, it is the latter, like, 100%. But this isn't really the transformation that took place. What Dear Evan Hansen was, was a kind of compassionate satire that, despite its empathy for its characters, never strayed too far from its cynical roots, as a comment on the way grief can be commoditized, the way social media encourages a superficial and sensationalized understanding of even the most deeply personal issues, and why that's so hard to escape from despite the ever-growing loneliness it feeds. What it became was exactly everything it professed to challenge. A viral soundtrack mistaken for the feel-good platitudes it intended to question, culminating in a movie adaptation that embraced this false idol. So when film critic Alison Wilmore described it as an act of sabotage that's near avant-garde, that should have referred to more than just the casting. Because the way Dear Evan Hansen mirrors the trajectory of its title character is uncanny. A show that abandoned truth as soon as it tasted the glamour of mainstream appeal. So here it is, the truth about Dear Evan Hansen. Maybe. Um, it's, it's actually not uh, totally, totally clear cut. But it's at least fitting for the truth to be elusive here, since at the heart of the story lies, lies, untruth, deception, skullduggery. Of course, there's the big lie, Tian. The story being set in motion when Evan, confronted by the grieving parents of a fellow student who has just taken his own life, goes along with their mistaken belief that he was their late son's best friend, despite him not knowing this boy, Connor, at all. And you know how these things snowball. One minute you're innocently pretending you were friends with someone's dead son, and the next you're faking months worth of emails and turning yourself into their family like a baby cuckoo and launching a viral campaign of deceit to soothe your deeply ingrained emotional wounds. <laughs> oh, we've all been there. But there's also the lies behind the lie. The wound Evan was soothing with his deceptions. Anxiety. Because anxiety lies too. It makes you believe all kinds of bollocks. Evil, evil, evil. Evil. <laughs> And I don't mean the expected emotional response of, say, during the pandemic, those feeling for the first time the frustration of not being able to leave the house. The fear that something deadly lies just beyond its fragile walls. I mean the kind of anxiety that would lead, say, me, a recovering agoraphobic, to be quite happy during this time, looking out of my window like I fucking knew it. But the latter feels much harder to communicate, precisely because there isn't always an easy culprit, like deadly contagion, to be pointed to. As comic artist Ruby Elliott depicts here, the threat remains vague, inexpressible, sometimes even to ourselves. So we can only retreat to metaphor. Like, I can describe the sound of an anxious mind as the jittery clattering of ill-fitting bowls, but it's only an approximation, the final refuge of a pain which has no referential content, as Elaine Scarry describes chronic pain. It shatters language precisely because it is not of or for anything. Unlike the way we might love something or fear something, any pain without clear external cause resists translation and becomes uniquely isolating. So it's tempting to take comfort in anything that makes us feel good, regardless of whether it stands up to scrutiny. This is the third fabrication in our unholy trinity. And Dear Evan Hansen expresses it through song. And not superfluously. It's really the ideal medium to both uncover emotional truth and scrutinize manipulation. Because if there's anything we can get swept up in, it's music. He lied to us through song. I hate when people do that. When the first act closes with Evan singing the show's defining viral sensation, You Will Be Found at Connor's Memorial, with its catchy quick fixes and feel-good solutions, it's as culture writer David Sims put it in The Atlantic, a clever jab at the way authentic emotions are packaged for the world of easily digestible online media. Surely no one can ignore the irony of its empty platitudes, because no one found Connor, and no one found Evan. This song is just another of Evan's reinventions telling the story of his own most desperate moment and imagining a friend came to help him, when, in reality, no one did. And yet, with full knowledge of its deception and decades of irony poisoning in my withered millennial heart, even I can't help but emotionally wave my glow sticks and blubberingly sing along. When you're broken on the ground, you will be it's 
it's undeniably effective. So of course for anyone listening to the soundtrack out of context, which theatre prices being what they are was a lot of people, the song became the very thing it caricatured. Either a gratingly sentimental cliché, or an uplifting message to take genuine comfort in. And when the song did resonate with so many people, it's hard to say it was all meta-commentary, you fools, you absolute muppets. Because if in this show about the struggle and importance of being seen, an anxious, isolated teen audience can finally see themselves and finally feel understood, then there is truth in it. These are the people who are found. But being seen, like really seen, isn't without its complications. What Dear Evan Hansen offers us here are the rewards of being seen, but privately, without us having to submit to the mortifying ordeal of being known. A cake that Evan is also trying to both have and eat. It's a defining dilemma of the social age. Never has the opportunity to be seen been so great, but never too has the pressure. And the screens that populate the stage are a constant reminder of both this oppressive demand to consume and be consumed, as well as the ghost of an enticing fantasy that no one ever really feels a part of. I think everyone as a teenager has retouched their personality to feel normal or cool or accepted, to project their ideal self. Maybe with phrases such as, yeah, like, High School Musical is so embarrassing, I totally don't know all the words to Breaking Free, what? G get out of my room! <clears throat> for, for example. But if the thing you're embarrassed about is your whole self, the recognition you crave is also your deepest fear. The fear of anyone really seeing you. What really makes anxiety hard to talk about isn't the limitations of language, it's shame. Bo Burnham's 2018 film Eighth Grade documents a similar, though much more innocent, motivational roleplay in 13-year-old Kayla's vlogs. Her advice to be yourself being much easier to announce than enact. But as she plays to a non-existent audience, this performance is a way to lie to herself before anyone else. Something that could probably be said of a lot of our social feeds, and can definitely be said of Evan. I guess I wanted to believe Cause if I just believe, then I don't have to see what's really there. And Evan isn't the only character who's projecting a false self. His classmate Jared hides behind cynicism, profiting from Kano's suicide by selling memorial merchandise and insisting Evan isn't his real friend. But his stage directions introduce him as having a swagger only the deeply insecure could pull off, and dialogue implies that, in fact, Evan is the closest he comes to having a friend at all. And fellow student Alana uses grades and extracurriculars to distract from her own loneliness, speaking only of acquaintances with barely concealed desperation in her almost too wide smile. These three all undoubtedly exploit Connor's suicide for attention, but it's because they mistake being superficially seen as their escape from the isolation they fear is leading them to the same end. It's a surprisingly sympathetic exploration of narcissism, viewing this self-absorption as both cause and consequence of loneliness, a perpetuating cycle where their need for people to see them is impeded by their own inability to see anything but themselves. Something certainly exacerbated by the turbulence of adolescence, but I think there's a wider implication for everything that ever gets obscured by the unwavering supremacy of, oh no, my feelings. But maybe that's only because these feelings often aren't given an outlet. From a bad mood to a character flaw, anything that could be deemed negative is bulldozed by the doctrine of good vibes only. And opposite slogans like it gets better, we have instead the relentless message from mainstream political parties and media alike, summarizes journalist Simon Reynolds, that this is as good as it gets, so deal with it. Dear Evan Hansen presents us with this philosophy in its purest form, an emotionally repressed middle-aged man. When Evan finally opens up to Connor's dad about his fraught relationship with his own father, he's met without even so much as an acknowledgement. Connor's dad instead immediately returning to his song about baseball, despite the context of that song being doing things the right way even when it's hard. Damn it, Larry, read into your own subtext. This retreat, again to metaphor, is endemic to how uncomfortable emotions are buried in polite society. No one wants to see you be emo on main. 
and death remains such a taboo that people stay unalived in hope of evading the strong arm of content moderation. In fact, this kind of moderation is so pervasive that the movie decided to cut pretty much all of this in favour of characters acting with pure intentions and PSA-worthy exposition about mental health. Because sure, you should be honest and talk about your feelings, but maybe you should hide the really bad stuff, you know? It's not very becoming. So, Evan isn't the only one who lost his way trying to rebrand. I guess just like when Connor's parents looked at Evan and saw hope in connecting to the son they lost, Evan wanted to be that. When people looked at Dear Evan Hansen and saw a soundtrack of uplifting songs they could connect to, the show wanted that too. Because it feels good to be loved. Good enough to sacrifice nuance and integrity and truth. Especially when your show about the messy morality of human impulse got a little messy itself, since this exploration is essentially derived from reducing Connor's suicide to some kind of MacGuffin, motivating the characters, but insignificant in itself. A move that we in the business call a big no-no. Because even if the intention was to erase Connor as commentary, to examine how individuals are treated by a system that looks to both suppress and commoditize mental health, it was only achieved by also erasing Connor in practice. The collateral damage of telling a story about this unsightly inclination to center ourselves in every story via a character that they're very much centering in this story but the show is always asking us to hold two things at once. Evan, the manipulative interloper in someone else's tragedy, and Evan, the reluctant lead of his own private tragedy. David Sims writes in The Atlantic that the writers want the audience to stay on Evan's side, but I've always found it hard, suggesting it's only ever achieved by the emotional arc coming primarily through songs that overrule moral logic but I don't think we have to stay on Evan's side to show him mercy. In Act 2, Evan turns into a... Hang on, let me check my notes here. Oh, uh, a right little shit. But he's still also a scared, lonely child. He can be both. And we can condemn his actions without condemning him as a person. And while the production clearly demonstrates how music and emotion can be used to manipulate, I think it shows how this power can be used for good as well as evil. It's difficult to connect with each other. You know the world can see us in a way that's different than who we- Wait. <laughs> How did that get in there? What I'm saying is, in the age of social media, we find enough tools to create distance and apathy, to reduce and anonymize, that sometimes it takes a little razzle-dazzle to finally see each other's humanity. Maybe we wouldn't feel as compassionate for Evan if it wasn't for the music. and. That would be a shame, because he deserves compassion. We all do. And it's not like anyone would say, oh, you know the problem these days, too much empathy. Maybe the lesson Dear Evan Hansen is teaching isn't honesty, it's forgiveness. From the opening song, we see characters trying their best to communicate and understand each other. Another stellar conversation for the scrapbook. Another stumble as I'm reaching for the right thing to say. But emphasizes that no matter how it seems, no one really knows what they're doing. Does anybody have a map? Anybody maybe happen to know how the hell to do this? I don't know if you can tell, but this is me just pretending to know. It's a song about parenthood, but the brave face parents might put on for their children is the same one those children eventually use to face the world. And the pressure to have it all figured out is trending younger and younger. About the film Eighth Grade, director Bo Burnham said, The stuff I thought was funny when I was 16 is up there forever. And part of this movie is like me going back to a time before then and forgiving myself. And the Washington Post continued, He thinks maybe once everyone is haunted, as he is, by the public versions of their younger half-baked selves, we'll have to grant some blanket pardon. We'll forgive him we'll forgive everybody. So, in the spirit of forgiveness, maybe we should cut the movie some... No, sorry, I can forgive Evan exploiting a tragedy for personal gain, but I can't forgive these creative decisions. Dear Evan Hansen is about lying, but not the outlandish, scandalous lies its plot hinges on. It's the small touch-ups, the little reinventions, to use the show's own words. The pressure to masquerade as whatever we perceive as normal, 
the neurodivergent urge to say, oh, sorry, I forgot, rather than saying, just considering the logistics of this simple task made me cry. Because somehow it feels more acceptable to appear insensitive than weird. Because nothing feels more important than convincing everyone that, yeah, sure, no one here but us neurotypicals. But while social media has long been a force for playing dress up as a functioning, capable adult living their best life, hashtag blessed, hashtag thriving, in the years since Dear Evan Hansen debuted, we've seen a resurgence in the honesty of the early internet. What would have once been anonymous blog posts returning as relatable content and goblin mode, which was even Oxford Dictionary's official word of 2022. This turn to acceptance and candor follows the recent trend for authenticity. And maybe that's all this is, a trend, susceptible to the same false projection as any other ideal. Sure, Photoshop and filters are out, but what's in is YouTubers preserving the lines they misspeak and the props they knock over like an integrated blooper reel. Any aesthetic can be co-opted for profit and clout, even self-acceptance. And if self-acceptance is seen as the goal, there's a danger it could be used to simply excuse and perpetuate bad behaviour. Which I think is what some audiences feared at what they saw as the lack of repercussions Evan faced at the end. But what Evan does face is the reality of really being seen. That is, the mortifying ordeal of being known. And only through enduring that pain could he finally be free. Like if emotional growth was some kind of saw trap. But that isn't the end of it. Because self-acceptance isn't an end goal. It's the base from which we can finally start to grow. Since, as Mr. Rogers said, I don't think, I don't think anybody, anybody can grow unless he really is accepted exactly as he is. And while no one can really be seen in the private safety of a theatre audience or pressing play again for the 37th time in an evening, Dear Evan Hansen gives the people who need it the space to see themselves and just says, we're here whenever you're ready. We're breaking free There's not a star in heaven that we can reach If we're trying, so we're breaking free Oh, we're breaking free And all the world can see us In a way that's different than who we are